So uh, in the next uh, little while, we're going to talk a little bit about behavior of thermoregulation. So the, the previous speakers mentioned it uh, in, in different areas, uh, in different uh, different uh, times, but uh, this is going to be entirely the focus of, of our talk for the next 20 minutes. So the thermoregulatory system has two branches, the autonomic and endocrine branch, which mainly uses uh, 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 responses such as uh, thyroid uh, hormonogenesis to increase basic metabolic rate or uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, these are responses to try to uh, defend heat balance. And then we have the other side, which is the behavioral aspect, uh, and it, uh, uh, it uses responses such as uh, changing of posture, change of clothing, Changing of tactics during a game, for instance, uh, uh, one of the earlier speakers today mentioned uh, increasing of passing. Uh, I think this is because people just get uh, don't want to exercise in the heat. So we change behavior to maintain heat balance. And this is what we're going to focus uh, our, our talk today. And uh, the, 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 an important understanding between these two systems, an important description is that this one, this system, this system has a certain capacity. Uh, uh, as Oli mentioned before, there's a certain capacity to, uh, to, uh, of, of heat dissipation, and uh, uh, if you uh, pass that, then uh, core temperature keeps rising to catastrophe. But this system here, this branch, has near infinite capacity. If we really want to heat ourselves up, we can even light our body on fire. So there's really no uh, limit to, to, this, to this branch. Now, Humans are quite inefficient in terms of uh, producing ATP for cellular work. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the available energy in the foodstuffs, uh, at least 60%, is lost in the environment as heat, in the environment meaning the surrounding tissues. Uh, even if we consider cycling, which is uh, probably the most efficient physical task, uh, there at least 30% of the uh, available energy in Sorry, 70% of the available energy is, is, is wasted as heat, and only 30% we actually use for work. Uh, so, for example, if we really want to, if we have a physical task, uh, 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 cycling at uh, 100 watts, in order for the body to actually produce this work, it needs to break foodstuffs enough to produce 330 watts uh, of energy, and then, which means that we have approximately 230 watts dissipated as heat. This has to be dissipated. Otherwise, core temperature will go up, and we all know that when this happens, a lot of studies in the literature have shown that performance goes down. So, uh, because changing exercise intensity affects uh, a heat balance, then in, in f from a behavioral thermoregulation point of view, we consider changes in exercise intensity as thermoregulatory responses, and this is a, a basic premise of my talk today. Uh, we're going to view, at least based, uh, at least in, in, in terms of self-paced exercise, so changes in the intensity of self-paced exercise will be viewed as thermoregulatory behaviors. Now let's start from the beginning. How do we sense, in order, in order to make, to adapt our intensity, to adapt our behavior, we need to sense, first of all. So there's two types of sensors in the body to, to perceive heat. Uh, the First one is the peripheral thermosensors, and these are called transient receptor potential ion channels. There are some proteins on the cell membrane of uh, pain and temperature sensitive neurons. Uh, they're approximately 30, and they're divided into six, six categories. So their axons project to the lamina one of the spinal cord, and then the signals are transferred to the hypothalamus, the brainstem, and the insular cortex. Here you see the different uh, uh, ion channels, the TRP ion channels, and the different temperatures that each one is activated. These are the peripheral ones. We also have some central ones, although the, our knowledge uh, there is a little bit limited. Uh, so uh, there has been some studies in the literature that have recorded different behavioral thermoregulatory responses when uh, uh, tissues or areas such as the medulla or the pons of the midbrain have been, are being stimulated or the orbital frontal, the insular, and the somatosensory cortex, the amygdala. And recently, uh, there was a paper in, in uh, mice that uh, recorded uh, behavioral thermoregulation uh, when brown adipocytes were uh, stimulated. And we uh, uh, just completed the first study in humans that has some interesting uh, similar results. But again, there's uh, more research uh, uh, that is needed in that perspective. 
Now, I mentioned before that the, the peripheral thermosensors send signals to the hypothalamus and the brainstem. And the hypothalamus is well known as the thermoregulatory uh, um, center of the brain. However, it's an, an important take-home message from this talk is that this, uh, the, the hypothalamus is mainly involved in autonomic uh, thermoregulation. In terms of behavioral thermoregulation, uh, the, uh, the, the signals transferred from the lamina uh, uh, go to, uh, also to the insular cortex. And the insula is the main center for behavior, the main center that creates feelings. Uh, uh, Craig has done a lot of work in this, in this regard. For example, here you see uh, activation in subjective cooling, and uh, obviously it's the right uh, insula. And so the, the in there's an integration of, the, uh, of uh, neural signals coming from different areas in that uh, brain area, and they create what we know as different feelings, among which is thermal perception. Uh, for example, here you see activation uh, uh, again, the, the same area uh, in the insula, this is fMRI images uh, of uh, cooling here on the top, uh, either the neck or the, uh, the hand, and also activation uh, below uh, of heating different areas of the body, and, and uh, again, we have the same sort of uh, uh, understanding, that's where the, the, the feelings come, and that's where we perceive uh, uh, what the signal is. Again, it's important to, to remember that uh, the preoptic anterior hypothalamus is mainly uh, involved in autonomic thermoregulation. It doesn't play a major role in behavioral thermoregulation. And, and also, uh, the other way around, the neural pathways involved in behavioral thermoregulation don't really uh, have much to do with triggering thermo effector responses, such as sweating or shivering or, or, or whatnot. Now, Let's move from, from, from the neural aspect let's, and, and, and start going into what we can measure in humans. Uh, in humans, there are four different things that we measure in terms of behavioral thermoregulation, at least most of the studies. Uh, the, uh, the two more, most uh, uh, famous ones, most popular ones, are obviously thermal comfort, which is the subjective indifference with a the thermal environment, and also thermal perception, thermal sensation, sorry, which is the relative intensity of the temperature that we sense. Now, when we are at rest, right now, you and me, uh, the thermal discomfort, the opposite of comfort, uh, it's, it's what mainly drives behavioral thermoregulation. However, during exercise, research shows that it is the perceived exertion of the task, the perceived exertion of exercise, that mainly regulates uh, our behavioral thermoregulation. And uh, we will discuss this in the next uh, few slides. So. Uh, one important aspect in terms of uh, behavioral thermoregulation, especially with respect to exercise in the heat, is what is the basis of our decisions? What, do th what does the body use to make a decision on whether to run, uh, uh, to, to catch a ball or not to run, whether to pass or not to pass? Uh, we, we tried uh, to, to see this, what is the basis of our thermal uh, decisions, by giving people uh, a liquid conditioning garment, which is a suit that is perfused with water. And by changing the temperature of the water, you can obviously heat or cool the body. So we uh, put them through a very long two hours uh, exposure to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And we gave them this suit and we asked them to use it freely to adjust the temperature uh, as they thought was best for them. And also during in the middle of this exposure, we asked them to exercise for 10 minutes. Uh, also, we told them that the purpose of the study was totally different, to take away any bias that they would possibly have. They thought that the purpose of the study was to uh, assess their manual function of the hands during this cold exposure. And uh, here are some of the results. You see here the inlet water temperatures. This is what they were controlling. So they had a, they had a, a lever and uh, they, they were adjusting that. And as you can see in the first part of the cold exposure, this is to minus 20 degrees Celsius environment, the, uh, they had a relatively stable water temperature. And then when they started exercising, they immediately reduced the temperature of the water, obviously because they were starting to generate heat. And then also again uh, afterwards, uh, they uh, increased the temperature a little bit. Here also, obviously, you see the heat that was retained in their body. Obviously, some of this heat is being lost with the pipes of the suit, but most of it is retained. Uh, and uh, interestingly, as you can see, uh, a lot of the heat is being retained here in the body, but very little uh, uh, during exercise and afterwards. 
Another important aspect was that in this study was that both rectal and esophageal temperature increased obviously after exercise because of uh, the produced heat. At the same time, skin temperature went down obviously because the suit that you can see here is attached to the skin. So when they reduced the temperature of the, of, the, of the water, obviously this affected skin temperature. But what was kept constant was mean body temperature as a result of this, this configuration here. So this led us to believe that it, what drives behavioral thermoregulation is in fact mean body temperature. Afterwards, however, we realized that because we were actually controlling, we were manipulating this, this variable, the mean body temperature, wasn't free to vary. We were changing it with the suit that we used. So uh, we, we went on and, 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 and conducted a, a few more studies, and I'm going to uh, show you some of them. A very interesting study was done by Schlater et al. Uh, a few years ago, and they used a different model to assess what is the basis of our thermal decisions. So they used a, a model known as shuttle box, where you have two different chambers, two different temperature extremes, and the people, the, the subjects are allowed to move from one to the other whenever they wish. Whenever they feel uncomfortable with the current environment, they can go to the other environment. Obviously, both of them are extreme. The first one was 45 degrees Celsius, the other one was 10 degrees Celsius, and they were allowed to move back and forth as they wished. So what they did was they monitored rectal temperature, skin temperature, thermal comfort uh, sensation, and the time that the, the people spent. And these were monitored the moment at which they actually wanted to move to the next chamber. And uh, these are some of the results. As you can see, core temperature, this is uh, the results of one particular subject. As you can see here, te core temperature didn't change very much. It stayed more or less the same. But there were huge deviations in skin temperature, obviously. Obviously because of uh, the people moving from one chamber to another. And uh, these were also followed by changes in thermal comfort. And uh, also, uh, when uh, here you see uh, uh, rectal temperature, skin temperature, and thermal comfort, when they chose to move from the heat to the cold, and from the cold to the heat, you can see that core temperature in the two decisions was similar. Uh, however, uh, skin temperature was very different, and also thermal comfort was very different. And this led, uh, this led the authors to, to, to conclude that behavior was mainly driven by skin temperature and not core temperature. However, because they used rectal temperature, they received a lot of input that uh, rectal temperature is very well known to have a delay uh, if, if, if uh, you give people a stimulus, uh, rectal temperature would show the response five, ten minutes later. So probably it wasn't the best, uh, the best indicator to record. So they repeated the study, very similar, shuttle box again, there were slightly different conditions, but uh, very similar. And uh, uh, in this case, they confirmed the results. Uh, here you can see rectal temperature didn't change between uh, from hot to cold and or uh, cold to hot. Uh, there was a, s a small but significant change in esophageal temperature, which changes much more rapidly. However, that was opposite from the actual behavior. So here you see it with blue, with, uh, sorry, dark, you see the decision from going from hot to cold, so when you're uh, hot. Uh, and here these, there was a significant increase when the subjects wanted to move from the cold to the hot. They were already cold. And you can see that they were actually, the, the esophageal temperature increased while they were in the cold environment. Obviously, this is because of a redistribution of blood flow from the periphery to the scent to the core. And that's why esophageal temperature actually went up. Uh, and uh, obviously, this doesn't mean that there's, the, their behavioral thermoregulation was, was because of this factor. And because, again, mean skin temperature, uh, forearm to finger temperature, and metabolic rate were different, uh, the authors uh, um, concluded that uh, behavioral thermoregulation is mainly driven by skin temperature and not core temperature. We did a, recently a study where we had, uh, we used uh, what is known as an RPE clamp protocol where you ask people to exercise at the perceived uh, rate of uh, exertion. And uh, it was a 60-minute cycling protocol, and the, the RPE, we set the RPE at 14, which is between somewhat hard and hard. The, and uh, what we did was we changed the ambient conditions from 20 degrees Celsius to 35, and then to 20 again. 
And uh, what's important was that we didn't tell the subject this. We told them that they were basically doing a study to uh, evaluate an exercise protocol. So they didn't know that this would happen. And we wanted to see whether they would regulate their exercise intensity uh, based on these conditions. What we found was that there was a progressive reduction in, uh, in exercise, in power output. Uh, however, although when we introduced the heat, when we increased the temperature from 20 to 35, there was a, a reduction in, in power output. However, when we put the temperature down again to 20 degrees Celsius, there was no restoration. Uh, this led us to believe that small and brief changes in, uh, uh, in ambient conditions, such as only 20 minutes and only, remember that it took a while for temperature in the, in the chamber to go up and then to go down again. So in reality, the, the stimulus wasn't that strong. So obviously, brief and small changes like that probably do not uh, um, affect, uh, do not need the behavioral adaptation, at least a significant enough. However, if the environment is significantly different, this will cause behavioral adaptations. Here you see the results of a study, a uh, recent study by Slater, that uh, uh, they used, uh, they, they did an all-out 30-minute uh, cycling protocol in two different environments, compensable environment 20 degrees Celsius and uncompensable at 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, here, obviously, you can see the cadence in the, in the 20 degrees Celsius environment. It was constant throughout. There was obviously fatigue here and, uh, and the load. So both RPMs and the load were reduced. And as a result, obviously, power output was uh, significantly reduced. So obviously, where there is a huge difference, where there is an important difference between two environments, uh, the, there is behavioral adaptation to reduce exercise intensity in order to maintain uh, heat balance. Now, what is important here? Is it, uh, is it uh, heat or is it uh, the perception of heat? This was uh, addressed by, in a study, again by the same group, a recent study where they looked at uh, uh, thermal versus non-thermal stimuli. Remember the peripheral sensors that I mentioned before, the TRP ion channels, these are activated either by heat or cold or also by uh, non-thermal uh, factors such as menthol and capsaicin. So what they did in, in this study were was they, they did an exercise protocol, uh, an RPE clamp again. They asked people to exercise uh, at uh, an RPE of hard to very hard. Uh, and they were, the subject were wearing a liquid conditioning garment. And this time, the temperature was set at 55 degrees Celsius. So they felt very hot. And they had five different conditions. Obviously, the control condition. And then they had a thermal face cooling, where they had the fan in front of the, the subject's face. They had a non-thermal face cooling where they uh, put uh, menthol cream on the subject's face. They had thermal face heating with a, uh, a fan that was uh, blowing hot air. And then a non-thermal face heating where they, where they put uh, capsaicin uh, cream on the face. The results were uh, very interesting. First of all, uh, this, this is the uh, total work uh, percent uh, from control. And as you can see, the cooling and menthol gave the same responses, meaning that both thermal and non-thermal uh, uh, cooling um, increases performance. And uh, also, uh, obviously, uh, warming of the face reduced performance. And, uh, but this wasn't entirely, there was a reduction with capsaicin, but uh, the, this was not significantly different from control. If we see the same results from a different perspective, here you see power output uh, from the beginning to the end of exercise. And uh, obviously with, uh, with uh, face warming, subjects uh, exercise less time, significantly less time than control and with capsaicin, and significantly more time and uh, obviously higher power output with the uh, menthol and the uh, face cooling. However, uh, uh, this is again um, uh, mean face temperature here. The three, uh, here we have warming. Uh, in the middle we have control capsaicin and menthol, obviously because there was no true uh, heating or cooling in, the, in, the, in these two conditions. Obviously, uh, face temperature remained constant. And here we have cooling uh, face temperature. And uh, there were no uh, changes, uh, no significant differences in mean skin temperature or 
uh, core temperature was just increased uh, across time. However, obviously, uh, uh, thermal, facial thermal discomfort was different. Uh, in, the, in the top, we have uh, heating and capsaicin. In the middle, we have control. And uh, menthol and cooling uh, are uh, at the bottom. So to summarize, uh, in, in, in this study, they showed that facial temperature and thermal perception, they are both uh, important modulators of behavioral thermal regulation. And uh, it is not necessary to actually change the temperature uh, uh, in the periphery uh, in order to uh, induce a thermal behavior response. So to conclude this talk, uh, the take-home messages from, from, from this talk is that changes in ex exercise intensity obviously affect thermal regulation, and therefore they are considered uh, thermoregulatory behaviors. What we sense, uh, 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 we sense heat or cold using uh, in the mainly in the periphery, uh, with uh, TRP ion channels that are uh, expressed, uh, proteins that are expressed in temperature sensitive neurons. And um, they are the, the main uh, thermal sensors of behavioral thermal regulation. They send uh, their signals to the insula where uh, they're integrated with other signals across the body to actually create what we call feelings. These ion channels in the periphery uh, are the ones that actually drive thermal regulation because thermal regulation, behavioral thermal regulation is driven by skin temperature and not core temperature. Also, it's important to remember, especially in the applied settings, that brief and small changes in ambient conditions, such as shading a few for, uh, for some minutes because of some clouds, will not affect behavioral thermal regulation, or a task that is already ongoing, probably because exercise al is already a very strong stimulus. And uh, finally, that behavioral thermal regulation is equally affected both by thermal and non-thermal stimuli. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, I just had two quick questions. One is, uh, you didn't discuss skin wettedness. And I know Gonzalez and Gaggy had done stuff with skin wettedness causing discomfort. So my question would be, with skin wettedness, it does contribute to thermal discomfort, but how does it? How is it sensed? Is it just that basically, as the skin gets more wet, it feels warmer? Yes, exactly. Uh, there's no, at least to, to, to my knowledge, there's no uh, thermal sensors or TRP channels that are involved in skin wetness. Uh, I suspect that uh, it has to do with uh, with um, uh, the actual the actual heat dissipation on the skin itself. So um, um, from a behavioral thermal regulation point of view, probably it affects uh, the, in, in the same manner as uh, skin temperature per se. And that was really interesting about the, the face cooling and warm, or apparent cooling and warming sensations. Um, what do we know about the distribution of some of the different trip receptors in the face? Is it different than other areas of the skin? Well, as far as I know, no, there, there are uh, the, Obviously, there's inter-individual differences. As far as, as far as I know, there are differences uh, in TRP ion channels uh, across the body. People are, uh, different people are, have a different distribution. But uh, um, also, there's different skin, different types of skin on, on, on the surface. Uh, and, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know if there's differences in different areas of, of the skin, of the face skin itself. At least to my knowledge, there's no such, it's quite tricky. To, to measure that. At least in humans, it's quite tricky to measure. So I'm not familiar with data that uh, shows different distribution in different parts of the face. OK, thank you very much for your nice presentation. We have to move to the uh, next presentation. Thanks. Thank Bye.